All right, so welcome back. This is going to be our very first screencast for Chapter 20. Um, before we actually start this screencast, I do want to remind all students that we did not have any screencast for Chapter 19, and Chapter 19 was the clicerate. We're going to go ahead and start the screencast again with Chapter 20, and Chapter 20 is going to focus on the crustaceans. So we're still talking about arthropods, but we're going to be talking about the class Crustacea. Now when you talk about crustaceans, we're talking about a pretty large group. If you notice it says there's over 67,000 living species that have been discovered up to this point of crustaceans. Um, actually, when you take the crustaceans and you combine them with the insects, they actually compose over 80% of all named animal species on this planet up to this point. Um, and that's a pretty big number. Uh, the main distinguishing characteristic of all crustaceans is going to be two pairs of antenna. And you can see these two pairs of antenna over here on the right hand side. So. When we look at the crayfish, for example, which is an example of a crustacean, um, in fact, this is going to be the um, crustacean you guys will dissect in class. You're going to notice they have one very long antenna, and then they have one called an antinual that is relatively short and is actually bilobed. You can see there's two extensions off of this antinual. Um, the reason they make this, um, or the reason they mention this as being a very distinguishing characteristic is because a lot of the arthropods will have antenna, but they actually only have one pair. So that helps distinguish this group from other arthropods. Now the head also has a pair of mandibles and two pairs of maxillae. And so the mandibles are over here on the right. You can see them right here. Just like um, the name sort of implies, it's a mandible. So it might be used to help the animal in feeding. Um, the maxillae, on the other hand, is another type of um, appendages you would find on a crustacean. And it can have various functions depending on the type of crustacean that you are looking at. Now, some segments may lack appendages. And again, looking on the right, you're going to notice we have lots of appendages in crustaceans. And that includes everything from the antenna all the way down here to the swimmerettes that you see towards the posterior end. Now, it does not include the telson that you see um, at the very end of the animal. But again, depending on the type of crustaceans, there are going to be some segments that do not have these appendages. Now, all appendages except perhaps the first antenna are considered by ramus. Now, what that means is that we have an appendage that actually branches in two. All right, and if you look over here at the antinual, you can see that um, by ramus arrangement right here for this second appendage on this crayfish. So again, the antenna doesn't fall into this category, but the antinual does. Now, back in chapter 19, we had introduced the term called tagmata. Now, tagmata basically means the way that you would actually arrange the animal. In other words, in terms of segmentation. Now, in crustaceans, we're talking about an arrangement where typically you're going to have a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. So over here on the right, you can see, again, the same picture that we had looked at before. This would be considered the head region of the animal. This would be considered the thorax. And of course, this would be considered the abdominal region. Now, in most crustaceans, what you're going to see is you're actually going to see a fusion between the head and the thoracic region. And so that's going to be given the name a cephalothorax. And you guys looked at that when you looked at the horseshoe crabs and the um, arachnids or the spiders that you had looked at in class. Now, the typical arrangement of tagmata in a lot of crustaceans, again, is going to be the head will actually include the first five segments of the animal. And again, they're going to be fused. The thorax would be. Um, eight segments and of course the abdominal region would have six but again I need to make sure you guys understand that depending on the type of crustacean these numbers can definitely vary by quite a bit. Now the anterior end is considered a non-segmented end that is given a special name that's called a rostrum. So over here on the right you can see the rostrum is right here and it's kind of um, pointing to this kind of um, kind of pointing extension that you see right here. And you're going to see that on the crayfish that you dissect. So that's, um, again, a non-segmented part of this animal. Now the telson with the last abdominal somite, again, a somite is another name for a segment, and what we call a uropod is going to form the tail of the animal. So over here, you can see the telson being represented, and you're going to see sort of these extensions off of the telson, and these are considered the uropods. Now the dorsal covering of this animal is considered, um, is called a carapace and again you had looked at that term when you looked at the horseshoe crabs and it can cover most of the body or it could simply just cover the cephalothorax of the animal. So again, depends on the species of crustacean that you're looking at. 
So again, looking at form and function when it comes down to crustaceans, we're going to look at the external features first. So when you look at the, um, the material that the animal is actually made out of, um, there's going to be a cuticle that's going to be secreted, and it's kind of a waxy type of material that's going to basically um, cover the outside of the animal, and it's going to be made up of three things. It's going to be made up of chitin, um, it's going to be made up of a form of protein, and it's also going to be made up of a material that's made of calcium. So we call that a calcareous type of material. Um, a lot of crustaceans will have very heavy plates that cover the body, and if they do have these heavy plates, they tend to have more of a calcium-based type of deposit in those um, parts of the animal. Now the joints do tend to be very soft and they do tend to be very thin. So this is going to allow a lot of flexibility in the body of the animal. So again, these are very heavily armored animals, but they do still need to move from place to place. They need to have um, a lot of mobility. So um, basically these joints that you would see maybe here, here, obviously throughout the different walking legs, even throughout the um, abdomen of the animal from here, here, and here. Again, these very thin, soft joints are going to allow these parts to be able to move. Now the telson, as we had said, is not a segment, but it does tend to, but it does bear the anus of the animal that you see right here. Now what you notice about crustaceans is that their appendages are actually pretty spectacular. Now they're spectacular because they have quite a variety of appendages that do lots of different jobs. So the specialization of the appendage is based, again as we had said, on the basic biramus or two-part plan. All right? Now again, biramus, if you look down here at this particular um, appendage, we have two parts that extend from this appendage. You can see this exopod and this endopod. Now this maxilloped, which is being represented right here, as we had just said, is going to have three parts. It's going to have the exopod and endopod that I just mentioned. And then it's going to have these um, two parts that you see right here, this coxa and this basis right here. It's going to make up the protopod of the um, maxilloped. But again, there's going to be lots of variety when it comes down to the appendages. And something I'm going to have you guys do in lab is you're actually going to remove all of these appendages from your um, crustacean, from your um, crayfish, and I'm going to have you glue each appendage onto a piece of paper. Now this is important because you need to understand how these appendages look and also of course know what they um, do for the animal. Now the internal features of these animals is going to be somewhat familiar to you because you've looked at a lot of these features in previous phyla that we studied. But one thing to note about these animals is that the muscular system and the nervous system of these animals um, basically exhibit the typical metamerism that we had looked at in the annelids. And remember the annelids were the earthworms. So what that means is that you're going to find every segment that will contain both some sort of muscle and some part of the nervous system. So that's going to be repeated through each segment. Now, if you notice it says this is going to be a persistent cavity that sometimes can actually be filled with blood. So when we talk about the circulatory system of these animals, you're going to notice that um, the heart itself is going to be towards the um, dorsal region of the animal, but we really don't have a lot of blood vessels. And so again, we're going to have an animal that's going to basically have um, cavities or sinuses in the animal that are going to fill up and basically bathe a lot of the organs that will be found in this animal. Now the muscular system are going to be arranged in antagonistic groups. When you talk about antagonistic, you're talking about essentially two muscles or muscle groups that actually um, go against each other. And what we do is we give those muscle groups special names. We call one group the flexors and one group the extensors. And so the flexors are going to work to pull that limb towards the body and the extensors are going to be used to straighten that limb out. Now the abdominal flexors of the crayfish are going to actually allow it to swim backwards. And so again, a flexor is going to pull that limb or that appendage towards the body. So what that means is that if you look at the abdominal region, you're going to notice again it's made up of lots of segments and that soft tissue is there. So when those um, muscles actually flex, that tail region or that abdominal region will actually curve under like that. And when it does that really quickly, it actually allows that animal to move backward. Now there's going to be strong muscles that are going to be located on each side of the stomach and these muscles are going to be important because what they do is they actually control the mandibles of the animal. So that's going to help the animal in terms of um, the way it actually feeds. Now the respiratory system of the animal can be a little bit different depending on the type of crustacean. Um, again, 
for the smaller crustaceans. Um, you might have animals that actually simply exchange gases across maybe thinner areas of the cuticle. So again, that sort of waxy type layer on the outside. For the larger ones that have maybe, again, it's more of a heavy type armor, um, what they're gonna do is they're gonna use what we call sort of a feather-like gill for gas exchange. And the, again, the crayfish that you guys will look at in class um, actually have um, these feather-like gills. Um, they do have a special structure called a baler. And of course, that baler is gonna be attached to the second maxilla and its main function is to draw water over the gill filaments. And what you're gonna notice is the gill filaments actually connect up to each of the walking legs. And so each of the areas that you see right through here actually attaches to a walking leg and there's gonna be a gill at the very end. So this gill baler is going to push the water across the gill for pretty efficient um, oxygen absorption from the water. And one of the things I'm gonna have you guys do is, as you remove each appendage, I want you to do your best to try to remove the gill along with the, um, the leg. Now, why would it be attached to the leg? Um, one of the reasons is that as this animal actually walks through the environment, it can actually move or separate these gills from each other. In other words, the more that you can move these gills throughout the water, so as the water is being drawn in, the more likely you're gonna be able to draw oxygen out of that water. Now when you talk about the circulatory system, as I had mentioned before, um, since we're gonna have a system where you're actually gonna have um, blood that's gonna pool within the animal, you have what we consider an open circulatory system. So there's really no evidence of too many blood vessels within these animals. Um, the hemolymph, which is also the blood, it's another name for blood in this animal, is gonna exit the heart through the arteries of that structure. So in other words, as that blood exits, and you can see that over here on the right, it's simply going to pool in these areas of the animal. Um, it's gonna pass to the hemocele, which of course is gonna return it to the heart via the sinuses. Now again, the hemocele is again, it's sort of another word that we might use for the cavities and the sinuses. Again, you're gonna notice a lot of overlap in these terms are basically there to help to make sure that blood is brought back and then of course recycled, it's gonna be reoxygenated, then of course passed back out into the animal. Now, they do have what we consider a dorsal heart and this dorsal heart is a single chambered heart and it's made of striated muscle which is gonna allow it to be able to contract and relax. Now again, the hemolymph for the blood is gonna to move to the gills. And again, if it's present for oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange. So again, very simple, take the oxygen out of the water. And of course, the CO2 that's being produced by the animal, make sure we put that back into the environment and get rid of it from the animal itself. Now that hemolymph, depending on the type of crustacean that you're looking at, could be colorless, could be reddish, or it actually could be bluish in color. Now when we look at reproduction in crustaceans, we're gonna look at um, specific life cycles that occur in these animals, and we're also gonna look at the relationship between the endocrine system, which is the system that actually produces hormones, and how these animals reproduce. Now most crustaceans are gonna brood or take care of their eggs in something called a brood chamber, and these can be attached to the abdominal region, um, more specifically to the abdominal appendages in the animal. And you can see that over here on the right in this crayfish. So what you see right here are the eggs of, of the animal. Now the crayfish will develop directly without a larval form. So in other words, when they do hatch, they look very similar to the, the adults. Now in the past we had called that direct development. But most crustaceans are gonna have a larval that's gonna be a, not quite similar to the adult. In other words, it's gonna be unlike the adult form. And because of that, it's gonna to have to go through a series of changes or it's gonna to have to metamorphosize. And eventually, of course, it will take on the appearance of the adult. Now, the Nopleus is a common larval form that actually has a uniramus first antenna and a biramus second antenna, similar to what we had talked about at the beginning of the um, screencast, and mandibles that will basically aid in locomotion or swimming for the animal. And if you notice over here on the right, you can see sort of the um, changes that occur with this particular um, larval form. If you notice when you look at the nopolis after it hatches from the egg, very, very different from what you would see in the adult animal. Now appendages and segments are gonna be added in a series of molts. And you can see this occurring over here again on the right hand side. 
Now in the previous screen we had used the word molt. So what we're going to do is we're going to give that word a different name. So when you talk about crustaceans, in fact when you talk about a lot of arthropods, you use the word ecdysis, which essentially means the same thing. Now, ecdysis is necessary for a crustacean to increase in size because that exoskeleton, in other words, that outer layer that is used to protect the animal, does not grow. And so there needs to be a way to get rid of that layer and produce a new one that's going to be a little bit larger and allow that animal to increase in size. Now, there's going to be lots of different things that are going to trigger the nervous system to actually begin that molting or that ecdysis process. And some of those things would be temperature, day length, or any other stimuli. It could be the presence of food, um, various other things. could be um, the presence of light. Now, the physiology of molting, which means the actual process of getting that molting to occur, could affect reproductive behavior, and also it could affect many other metabolic processes for that animal. Now, when you look at ecdysis, you're going to notice that the underlying epidermis is going to be used to secrete the cuticle. Now, over here on the right, I know it's kind of hard for you guys to see, but all of this right here actually represents the cuticle of the animal. But what we've done is we've broken that cuticle down into three layers. We call the outermost layer the epicuticle, the one that's in between, the exocuticle, then the one that is um, the lowest, or I guess would say underneath, called the endocuticle. But the epidermis that you see right here, that's going to be the one that's responsible for secreting that or those layers. Now this outermost epicuticle is going to be made of a very thin lipid impregnated protein. Now lipid of course is going to refer to fat and of course most of us know what a protein is. So there's going to be a combination between these two materials that actually form that epicuticle. Now because it's the outermost part of the um, cuticle itself and since it does contain a fatty material there's a good chance that it's going to help to sort of protect or sort of act sort of like a waterproof type of material for the animal itself. Now of course we do understand these animals do live in water but they do need to sort of maintain sort of a balance between the water on the outside and the inside of the animal. Now most of the cuticle is going to be composed of several layers of procuticle. Um, so again, procuticle would take into account the exocuticle and the endocuticle. So this exocuticle is going to lie right beneath the epicuticle and it's going to contain the protein, calcium salts, and chitin that would be found in the cuticle also. So again, it's a little bit different than that epicuticle that is right above. Now the endocuticle is going to have a very heavily calcified principal layer and an uncalcified membranous layer. So a layer that's going to be a little bit more flexible, but again, a little bit different from what you would see with that exocuticle and the epicuticle. Now, molting animals are going to grow in the intermolt phases or instars. So in other words, as we continue our discussion about arthropods, you're going to notice that we're going to use various terms that will actually imply at what part of the life cycle are these animals in. Now there's quite a variety of feeding habits when you talk about crustaceans. Now because crustaceans tend to have the same fundamental mouth parts, those mouth parts have been adapted to a wide array of different feeding habits. And some of those crustaceans that are considered suspension feeders, they have mouth parts that are basically specialized to create water currents that are going to be used to bring in plankton, detritus, and bacteria as food. Now there's some out there of course that are considered predators and so their mouth parts are going to be specialized to consume maybe various different types of larvae, could be worms, crustaceans, snails, and even some fish. There are those out there that are considered scavengers and what they're out there for is they're basically there to clean up or eat the dead animal and plant matter in the environment. Now crayfish have a two-part stomach that's going to be used to actually help it to digest the food that it brings in. Now, this two-part stomach is going to have a part that is specialized to grind up food, and this part is called a gastric mill. And you can look over here on the right, you can see this gastric mill located right here. And one thing again that I'm going to have you guys do, as you actually dissect into your crayfish, I want you to make sure you open up the stomach and you locate that gastric mill. All right, and it's going to be a very, um, very hard sort of um, reddish black structure. It kind of looks like teeth in the stomach of the animal. All right, so that's going to finish up our very first screencast for chapter 20. As always, please make sure that you have completed the study guide before you come to class.